what's the Torah portion called? Shalak. And you can see that. We'll go over the Hebrew letters. The, what's this letter? Shin makes the S8 sound. Lamed makes the L sound. Chet makes the Ch shalach. As a matter of fact, the apostles uh, in the original Hebrew language would, were called shaliachs, which they were sent. Apostle means to be sent. Well, that comes from the Hebrew, shalak, to send, and they were known as shaliachs. And so what is going on here? Who's being sent? What's happening? In the Torah portion. Anybody read the Torah portion? The spies are being sent out. We have 12 spies. And when we think of spies, you know, this is maybe a little bit different, but how many good spies and how many bad spies? Ten bad ones, two good ones. Well, let's begin. How many of you know that Abraham believed God? Did he? How many of you know when he believed God, he was a Gentile? Shock. He hadn't even been circumcised. He wasn't circumcised for 25 more years. So here we have to realize, number one, Abraham was a Gentile. And yet he was also filled with faith. But you know, interesting, he never got to experience the promise. Do you remember how in Shemot or in Exodus, when God appears to the burning bush to Moses, he says, Abraham never knew my name, the yud hey vav hey. He only knew me as El Shaddai. And we think, well, how can that be? Because when you read the Torah, Abraham built altars to the yud heh vav sacrificed to the yud heh vav So what does it mean when God says, he didn't know me as yud heh vav when he did sacrifices to the yud heh vav it says? Does anyone remember what I told you? Oh, my goodness. This is why we go over the same Torah portion every year. <laughs> okay, it's just like, I know my dad is a lifeguard, but I never knew him as a lifeguard to me. Okay, he may have saved a lot of people's lives, but he never had to worry about saving my life. Or my dad is a tax accountant. I knew he was a tax accountant, but I didn't know him as a tax accountant until he did my taxes. And so uh, people have a lot of names, a lot of titles. Of course, God has 100 names. And what he was saying is they, the difference between God's name, and we'll look at this in the second half. In Genesis 1, he's only called Elohim. And what does Elohim mean? He's the boss. He's the king. He's the judge. Okay? And he demands justice. But then in Genesis 2, he gets another name, and it's the yud heh vav Elohim, or the merciful God. Because when he creates man, man cannot live by strict justice alone. How many of you know we blow it? Okay, and so now he introduces another name. Well, Abraham knew he had that name. And what the name yud heh vav means the deliverer of the promise. Elohim makes the promise. He experienced God as saying, yes, he made the promise to me, but he never got experience really the promised land. He never owned it. He was called a stranger and a sojourner. So he never knew him as the fulfiller of the promise. He just knew him as the promise maker. Now Israel's coming out of Egypt, so now they get to experience him as the promise keeper rather than just the promise maker. Does everyone understand? Now, the generation of Moses, the generation who's going into the promised land, he's actually going to now keep the promise, was a generation of no faith. Abraham, who never experienced the promise, had faith in God that he would be a promise keeper. But guess what? The generation that he was the promise keeper was no faith. They had no faith at all. And when Yeshua was here on earth, all the miracles he was doing, and he said, your generation is a generation of no faith then. And then it says, concerning this generation, 2,000 years ago, Yeshua said, 
will there be faith on earth when I return? And so a lot of this is about faith. Now, here's the other thing. Perspective. How many of you know everybody has a different perspective? Two people can look at the same thing, and that person's a terrorist. No, he's not. He is a freedom fighter. I'm just saying husbands and wives have two different perspectives sometimes. Why? I heard a big yes over here from Dolores. <laughs> but the question is, everyone has a different perspective, and that's okay. Now, whose idea, we were talking about the spies being sent out to spy the promised land. Whose idea was it to have the spies spy? I hear God. I hear Moses. Who was it? See, everybody right now, we've all read it. We all have different perspectives. Okay, the choices are God, Moses, or the people. So how many think it was God? How many think it was Moses? How many think it was the people? How many are clueless and never raised their hand? I just want to make sure no one wants to commit, I guess. Okay. It's all about perspective. Let me give you a good example. This is a true story. Many, many, many years. How many of you know in India they still have arranged marriages? I mean, some places they still have it. Well, many years ago, a family was looking for a good match for their daughter. A young man was suggested who was very scholarly. He was well-mannered. He had a great future ahead of him. And the young lady's family seriously considered introducing her to the young man until her mother discovered that her prospective son-in-law was handicapped and walked with a permanent limp. On that basis alone, she insisted they call off the matchmaking. Soon after this, the mother was bringing some warm milk for her husband to drink before his morning prayer. But before she reached her husband, she fell and broke her leg. And she commented to a friend of hers, you know why this happened to me? It's because my husband shouldn't be drinking milk before saying his morning prayers. How often do some things happen and we always point the finger all different directions? Well, last week's Torah portion was concluding with the story of Miriam being punished because of what? Lashon Ra, evil speech. This reminds me of something else. Uh, as you know, we have Danny Ben Gigi and I have been working on the New Testament uh, as a download with Hebrew. Okay, so you can look at your screen and you'll see the Hebrew New Testament with the Hebrew transliteration and the English. And we've made thousands of corrections, uh, and hopefully be ready within a couple of months now for download. But how many of you know uh, the book of James in the Bible, right? Did you know his name wasn't James? What was his real name? What? Yaakov or Jacob. Right. They took Yaakov, and all through the Gospels, they translated it as Jacob. But then, all of a sudden, Yaakov becomes James. Now, why do you think Jacob's name becomes James? King James! He wanted a book named after himself. This is why in the English 1611 version, they're trying to honor King James. So Yaakov will translate as Jacob, but now we're going to call it James. That's like saying someone in Russia is named Paco, or, or someone in Mexico is named Igor. Okay. There is no James. Okay, but what was the name of Yeshua's mother? Miriam. It wasn't Mary. Where did Mary come from? Queen Mary, who was just before King James. They want to honor Queen Mary. This is all done in England, and he was the king of England. But anyway, that's just a side note. But we've corrected all of those things. All right. Numbers, let's begin. Uh, we begin. The Torah portion is Numbers 13, but I'm going to begin at 12 because here it talks about Miriam was shut out 
of the camp for seven days, and they did not journey until Miriam was brought in again. And then the people removed from Hazarot and pitched in the wilderness of Paran. Now think about this. They were supposed to move, but now they have to wait seven days, right? Everybody knew why they had to wait seven days. It's because Miriam was bad-mouthing. How would you like to be Miriam? And everyone's waiting on you. You got the plague. Now we got to wait seven days because of Miriam, you know. And so they kind of had a good idea. Whining and complaining wasn't a good idea. All right. <clears throat> so this week's Torah portion begins immediately after the story of Miriam's evil speech. And it tells the story of the spies who are filled with evil speech concerning the land of Israel. All right. The other thing is this. The spies that were sent, who were they? The princes, the head of every tribe. And all the princes knew very well why Miriam, you know, made them wait. was evil speech. And yet, they didn't learn from her situation. Okay, so let's take a look now at who sent the spies. But here's where you have to really understand the context. In Numbers 13, 1 through 3, Look at this. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, send you men. So who does it look like sent them? The Lord. But that's not what happened when you know the Hebrew. Okay, let's take a look. He says that they may search or spy the land of Canaan, which I gave to the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers, shall you send a man, everyone, a ruler among them. And so Moses by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. Okay, now, when he says to send you men, what is actually going on in the Hebrew is God was not telling him to send the men. He was, Moses actually was sending, the, but that's not the correct answer. I'm just kind of going through God says to Moses, you want to send them in? You send them in. So God wasn't commanding him to send them in. What God said was, Moses comes to him. You know, let's send men. And God says, fine. You send men. There's a Hebrew word that's not here in the English. Uh, it's shalak lecha, which means you send for you men. And we don't see that. We just see the you send men. But in Hebrew, it's send them in for yourself. So he was commanding him, you send them in if that's what you want to do. Now let's watch what happens. When they were told to search out the land, the Hebrew word for search. See, here's the problem with English. There are three different Hebrew words, but the same English word. <laughs> If there's three different Hebrew words, that means there's three different meanings. Why do we put the same meaning, search, search, search? So I'm going to show you the difference. The first search means go explore, meander around, see what the, if you want to trade goods, this kind of thing. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy 1, 20 through 23, talking about this incident after 40 years of wandering. Look at this. Moses says, I said to you, you are coming to the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God gives us. Behold, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up and possess it as the Lord God of your fathers has said to you. Fear not, neither be discouraged, and you will come near to me, every one of you, and said, look at this. Now we see it's the group that said, we want to send men before us. So we see what happens. It's the group that came to Moses and said, we want to send men. And then Moses goes to God and says, should we send men? And Moses, uh, God tells Moses, that's what you want to do. You just go ahead and do it. But it was the people that wanted to send the men. See, this is why it's perspective. You know, who's to blame? Well, let's look at every perspective. And then it says, and they shall search us 
out the land and bring us word again by what way we must go up into the cities we shall come. And the saying, Moses says, please be well. And so I took 12 of you, one of a tribe. But this time, the word search is different. God has said, let them meander around if that's what you want to do. But this time, it is kafar, and it means to dig. We want to dig into this, just like you want to dig into a situation to see if it's really what you heard. Okay, so think of dig as digging in the dirt. But that what they want to do, they don't trust God. So they want to do their own personal digging around to see what they come up with. Well, now look at Deuteronomy 124. It says, and then they turned and went up into the mountain and came to the valley of Eshcol. And what did they do? They searched it out. Well, this time the search is Ragal. And what does that mean? That means they begin to backbite and slander, investigation of a matter. We get the saying, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. If someone is giving you something, why are you inspecting it, checking it, wanting to make sure it's all good? They didn't trust God. They didn't believe God. So here we have three searches with three different Hebrew meanings that we miss. Now look at Numbers 13, 17 through 20. It says, and Moses sent them to spy. Okay, one verse says God sent them to spy. Another one, Moses sent them to spy. Another one, they wanted to spy. But when you put it all together, there were three different groups, it seems like. But initially, it was the people that initiated the wanting to spy. And they were searching it out because they didn't have faith in God. So we, this, But you don't see any of this in the English. And then what do we find? Uh, Moses sent them to spy out the land. And what happens? He says, go this way up southward, go up into the mountain, see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell there, whether they're strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it's good or bad, what cities they be that dwell in, whether they're in tents or strongholds, and what the land is, whether it is fat or lean, whether there's wood or not, but be of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. Okay, so how long did they spy out the land? How many days? Do you remember? 40 days. What day did they come back and give the bad report? The ninth of Av. The ninth of Av. Now, why is that significant, the ninth of Av? What's that? That because they brought the bad report on the ninth day of the month of Av, which is our late July, August, that day became cursed throughout all of Jewish history for the next 4,000 years. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple on the ninth of Av. Rome destroyed the temple on the ninth of Av. All the Jews were kicked out of England in 1290 on the ninth of Av. All the Jews were kicked out of Spain in 1492 on the ninth of Av. World War I started on the ninth of Av. Hitler's proclamation to kill all the Jews was on the ninth of Av. Okay. One of the other big dates when they worshipped the golden calf was the 17th of Tammuz. And what happens on the 17th of Tammuz? Do you know the Lebanon War in 2006 started on the 17th of Tammuz? That's the same time that Nebuchadnezzar from the north broke through and was invading Israel. And at that very same day is when the missiles from the north were hitting Israel. So we have to be on God's... If we want to know prophecy, if we call ourselves student of prophecy, if we don't know the biblical calendar, you're, you're like a prophet out in the ocean with a broken compass. Okay, now here's the thing. And I'm just going to give you rust. Let's say numbers happened in 1300 BC. We now come to Ezekiel about 800 years later. 800 years later, and look what happens in Ezekiel 20, verse 1. It came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, the tenth day of the month. What is the fifth month and the tenth day of the month? The tenth of off. 
This is the day after the ninth of Av, okay? And let's look at what God is telling Ezekiel. We see that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me, he says. This is almost 800 or 1,000 years later. It's the day after that very historical date, 1,800 1,000 years earlier. And Ezekiel is speaking to all the captives in Babylon. And he says to them, thus saith the Lord God, in the day when I chose Israel, and I lifted up my hand to the seed of the house of Jacob, and I made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, so it's talking about then. And then God says, when I lifted up my hand to them, think of a court. When, what happens when you lift up your hand? God, the creator, is swearing. He's lifting up his hand, and he's swearing to Israel, saying, I am the Lord your God. In the day I lifted up my hand to them, three times he's saying this, to why? To bring them out of the land of Egypt and into a land that I had already spied out for them. Why are they sending spies? God said, I already spied it out. It's great. Flowing with milk and honey. It's the glory of all the lands. And listen to what he told the Israelis as they were fleeing Egypt. Get rid of of every man, the abomination of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. They all were taking Egyptian pagan idols with them as they're crossing the Red Sea. And God said, get rid of them. And they didn't. They all held on to their idols. They all, as he's, they're crossing the Red Sea, they all have their little pet idol in their knapsack. How often when we get saved, go through a mikvah, do we still carry some of our baggage with us? We've got to put them down. We've got to get rid of it. It says, but they rebelled against me, and they would not listen. They did not every man cast away the abomination of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Wow. Most people don't understand that. Here you've got all these Millions of Israelis running across the Red Sea, escaping Egypt, and they all have a little idol with them that they want to bring. How often when we get saved do we bring a little idol with us that we have to battle with the rest of our life? And now here we see the ninth of all became a fast day, which is very important. And let's look at Numbers 13 now, 22 through 24. Oh, come back to this. I just want to give you the uh, pronun English pronunciation of all of those. <clears throat> now look at this. Here the spies are ascending by the south, and they came to Hebron, or Hebron. Where? Look at these. These three big guys are there. Ahimon, uh, Sishai, and Talmai, which were the children of Anak. Now one thing to point out, Lot Moab, Esau, they got their land before Israel did. And the Bible says all three of them faced giants, and they fought off the giants and took their land. But now Israel's facing giants also. But they're afraid. Lot's kids weren't afraid. Moabite's kids weren't afraid. Esau's kids weren't afraid. And so here are these three big giants. And it says, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt, and they came to this brook of Eshkol. They cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes. They bore it between two on a staff. They brought it the pomegranates and the figs, and the place was called the brook Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes, which the children of Israel cut down there. One thing I want to say, I don't have time to go into it this time. You don't see this in English. You only see it in Hebrew. There are letters missing in the word Eshkol, and it's, almost, it's always a vav the letter that's missing. Most people don't know God intentionally misspelled the Hebrew. God intentionally had Moses misspell the Hebrew language for reasons. But in English, we correct the misspelling. But we have to realize God misspelled it for a reason. But here we are. They see three giants, right? On the earth, they see these three giants. Well, guess what? How about the three spiritual giants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? 
right here. They're in Hebron. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were there when the spies spied. But they were too afraid of the three physical giants on the earth. They never thought about the three spiritual giants in the earth that God wanted them to see so they would have the faith that he would keep the promise and they would go attack. But they had physical eyes. They didn't have spiritual eyes. So what do we see here? Uh, okay, Numbers 13, 28, 29. It says, nevertheless, the people are strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains, the Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan. Oh, my goodness. Even the termites. No. So let's look at Numbers 13, 32. So what did they do? They spread an evil report <clears throat> of the land which they had spied out to the children of Israel. The land, though, which we have passed to spy it out is a land that what? It eats up the inhabitants. And all the people saw, we saw in it are men of great stature. So they insisted, they were the ones who insisted on seeing for themselves. But the spies did not realize that everything they saw in Canaan was actually a blessing. I'm going back to perspective. They saw huge fortresses. But that really meant the people lived in fear. Okay? The spies saw people dying. But God did that so the inhabitants would be preoccupied with burying them and not notice the spies. So often things happen and we look at it from one perspective, but God is looking at it from another's perspective. How often do you see the glass is half full or half empty? You know, it all comes down to attitude. Now, here, again, it says the land eats up the inhabitants. Look what Ezekiel is saying 800 years later in Ezekiel 36, 8 through 15. <clears throat> you mountains of Israel, you're going to shoot forth your branches. You're going to yield fruit to my people, for they are at hand to come. Behold, I'm for you. I'm going to turn into you, and you will be tilled and sown. I'll multiply men on you, all the house of Israel, even all of it. The cities will be inhabited. The waste places will be built. I'll multiply on you, man and beast, and they'll increase and be fruitful, and I will cause you to be inhabited after your former state, and I will do better to you than at your beginnings, and you're going to know that I am the Lord. Now, that's not Elohim. That's yud heh vav -Hey. Yes, I will cause men to walk on you, even my people Israel. They'll possess you, and you'll be their inheritance, and you will no more henceforth bereave them of children. Look at this. Thus says the Lord God, because they say to you, land, that you are a devourer of men, and you've been a bereaver of your nation, therefore you will devour men no more, neither bereave your nation anymore, says the Lord God, neither will I let you hear any more the shame of the nations, neither shall you bear the reproach of the people anymore, neither shall you cause your nation to stumble anymore, says the Lord God. So God's going to do something in the land of Israel. Now, <clears throat> here's something else I want to show you. Here is uh, Genesis 48. I I'm going to compare the Hebrew so you can see another mistranslation in the English. This, remember uh, Jacob crossing his hands over Ephraim and Manasseh, right? And Joseph is uh, complaining. And he tells, Joseph tells Jacob to don't cross your hands. And Jacob refused. And he said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people. He also shall be great. But truly his younger brother, Ephraim, shall be greater than he. And as he will become a multitude of nations. We all know that, right? Where it says greater than he, here it is in Hebrew, and it is me, manu. Me, manu. Everyone say me, manu. Which means greater than him. Everyone see that? Now, let's go to Numbers 13 in our verse. And it says, but the men who went up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we know. It is me, man, new. They're saying the giants are stronger than God. The giants are stronger than him. The translation isn't we, it's him. So now they're complaining, oh, we can't. Take the giants because they're stronger than him, not stronger than us. 
But you don't see that in English. The correct translation is they're saying the giants are stronger than God. Wow. Okay, so in Numbers 13.30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, we are able to overcome it. And, oh, okay, here's uh, where I have Genesis 48.19, your brother will be greater than he, me, Manu, but it's actually they are stronger than him. Okay, now before we go there, how much time do I have? Okay. Uh, number 1331 is where they say we, and it's me, man, new, which means really stronger than him. And then we go to Numbers 1333. It says, there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. How often do we think something about us and we think everybody thinks the same thing? That's not true. Just because you're putting yourself down, don't think everyone else is putting your, you down. So often we have the wrong perspective. Now, listen to this, and this is a, an important statement. Don't allow what others think about you how often do you wonder what other people think about you? What do they think about me? Okay. Personally, I could care less. I mean, you Google me on the internet. Oh my gosh, I'm all over the internet. Some people think I'm the Antichrist. <laughs> Who cares? I really don't care. Okay. Don't allow what others think about you to have life-altering effects. As long as you are doing what is right and the best way you know how, and with right intentions, you have no reason to concern yourselves what other people think. Okay? Uh, let's look at Numbers 14, 22 through 24. It says, because all these men, God says, has seen my glory and the signs which I've done in Egypt and in the wasteland, still have put me to the test ten times, and they've never given ear to my voice. And he says, they are not going to see the land about which I made an oath to their fathers. Not one of these by whom I have not been honored. Look at this. It all has to go with honoring God. We'll see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had a different spirit in him, he has been true, true to me with all of his heart. Wow. Him will I take into the land into which he went and his seed will have it for their heritage. Okay, now wait a minute. There were two good guys, Joshua and Caleb. How come Caleb is the one singled out, not Joshua? I think it's because Caleb is the one who initiated it. He was the first one, and of course, jo Joshua responded and agreed with him. But I think God honors Caleb here because he was the one who was the first to initiate that response. Now look at Joshua 2, 9 through 11. Here is Rahab. And she says to the men, now, you got to remember this. How long have they wandered in the land? 40 years. 40 years. This is 40 years later, and Rahab says, I know the Lord has given you the land and that your terror has fallen on us, and all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man. Because of you, the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. When the spies went, all of them were shaking in fear of, this, of Israel. This is saying 40 years earlier. I don't know how old Rahab is here. But she's saying, look, 40 years ago, everyone was terrified and their hearts were melting because of you. You could have went up to those walls and said, boo, and everybody would have ran. Look at verse 23 and 24. So the two men returned, descended from the mountain, passed over, and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, told him all the things that befell them. And they said to Joshua, truly, the Lord has delivered into our hands all the land, even all the inhabitants of the country are fainting before us. And this is even after 40 years. The heathen still remembered what God had done 40 years earlier. And they're still afraid. 
Go, okay, let's go back to Numbers 14, 1 through 4. Here, the congregation lifts up their voice and they cry, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses, against Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would to God we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And God says, I can arrange that. Sure, if that's what you want. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children would be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to another, let's make a captain and let us return to Egypt. Okay? Wow. And so look at Deuteronomy 11, 7 through 9. I'm going to have to hurry. It says, your eyes have seen all the great acts that the Lord did. Therefore, you're to keep his commandments that I command you today, that you can be strong. Go in and possess the land where you go to possess it, and that you may prolong your days in the land, which the Lord God swore to your fathers to give them and to their seed a land that flows with milk and honey. So here, after the 40 years, Deuteronomy happens in one month. It's Moses giving his final teaching before he dies. But get, get a load of this. Are you ready? This is something you may want to write down. Over 300 times in the Torah, God says he's giving the land of Israel to the Jewish people. Over 300 times they heard, I'm giving you the land. I'm giving you the land. I'm giving you the land. As a matter of fact, all the laws I'm giving you for the temple, okay, is because you're going to get the land. Over 300 of the commandments, get a load of this, over 300 of the commandments given before they even left Sinai could only be done in the land of Israel. We know there were 613 commandments, not 10. And of those 613, over half of the commandments were only done with there being a temple. And so why would God give them all these commandments if he wasn't going to fulfill it and give them the land? So it was a done deal. Then comes Joshua. In uh, Numbers 14, 6 through 9, here's Joshua, the son of Nun, Caleb, the son of Yefuna, which are them that searched the land. They rent their clothes, and now they speak to all the company of the children for Israel, and they end up saying, look, they're bread for us. And then in Numbers 14, 11, and 12, the Lord tells Moses, how long are these people going to provoke me? How long will it be before they believe me because of all the signs which I showed among them? I'm going to smite them with pestilence. I'm going to disinherit them, and I will make of you a greater nation and mightier than they. Okay, now how many of you, how many of you when your mom or dad was upset wanted to go hide somewhere until they were done? Okay, here God is upset. I'm going to destroy them. And Moses, I'm going to start over with you. Now, if that was me, I'd have said, great God, go get them. Fulfill your will. Start over with me. But that's not what Moses did. I mean, think about it. Moses, his thought was, oh my gosh, don't you destroy them because everyone will think you're impotent or a liar. This is the problem with Christianity, replacement theology. They don't side with Moses and saying, no, God, you are not going to disinherit the Jewish people because that means you're either were impotent or a liar. Much of Christianity says, yay, God, yes, throw out them rebellious Jews and make them start over with us. Total wrong thinking. And so in Numbers 14, 15 through 19, now here I have the 13 attributes of God when God put Moses in the cleft of the rock and went by. And look at this. It says, now, Moses says, if you kill all these people as one man, Then the nations which have heard of your fame will speak and say, because the Lord was impotent. He wasn't able to bring the people into the land. Therefore, he killed them all in the wilderness. And so now what does Moses say to the Lord? I mean, how many of you ever would tell God to repent? (laughs) I don't think so. But what does he say? He says, let the power of my Lord be what? Great. Great according to what you have already spoken to us 40 years ago, he says the Lord is long-suffering 
of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations. So he says, pardon, I beseech you, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your mercy and as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Wow. Now that's what Christianity should be saying concerning Israel. Now, here's something you don't see in English. You only see it in Hebrew. <clears throat> Can anybody read that word? Okay, you have the Y. This is the Yud, which makes what sound? The Y. What letter is this? Gimel. Makes the G sound. What's that letter? That's the Dalet, the D sound. It's Ye Gadol. Gadol means what? Great. And he says, let the power of my Lord be great. But in, it, I don't have our Torah school here, but in every Torah scroll, it's not written like that. It's written like that. It's got the Yud, which is the smallest letter in Hebrew, the Yud, which means your hand is really big. He says, let your hand, that, the, your great hand be powerful. All right. Now, we're going to talk about the attributes of God here in the second half. But look at Numbers 14, 26 through 29. The Lord spoke to Moses, to Aaron, you know, and he says, How long will I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? <clears throat> I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel, which they murmur against me. Tell them as truly as I live, says the Lord, as you've spoken in my ears, that's what you're going to get. And your carcasses are going to fall in this wilderness and all that were numbered of, uh, of you, according to the whole number from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. God <clears throat> really takes murmuring against him. Uh, not good. So what do we look at Romans 10 or uh, Numbers 14 and uh, 30? He says, no one's going to come to the land which I gave my word <clears throat> you would have for your resting place except for Caleb and Joshua. <clears throat> so our last verse, Romans 10, 14 through 15, <clears throat> it says, How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How will they preach except they be sent? Shaliach, <clears throat> as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Uh, what's amazing is, I don't have this verse here, but it's in Corinthians. It says all of these things referring to this Torah portion were written for our example. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Well, guess what? The ends of the world are coming. We need to learn from this. Now, here's the other thing. What's the Torah portion? Shalak, which means what? The sent. Okay. The Father sent Yeshua. Yeshua sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has now sent you. Think about this. He sent you, but we need to realize God is stronger than all the giants you face. The world, the flesh, and the devil are the three big things. But God in you is stronger. The problem is we have the same fears thinking, oh, the devil's so much bigger and stronger. He's not. He's like a cockroach. Stomp on him. All right? Let's stand. Have no fear. Then we'll take a break. Then we'll have some worship. And then I'll be back. Avinu Mokeno, our Father King, we just thank you so much, and, and I just pray people would have eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to understand. There is nothing to fear. There is no giant event in this life that is bigger than you or stronger than you. We all want to put our faith and trust in you. We know you're coming back, and we know you're coming back very soon. And we can hardly wait. We just want to fall in love with you. And I just thank you for everyone all around the world that is watching and listening and at every state at this time. We pray that you bless them. And Father, I just pray right now that you would put it in their heart that they would enable LCDI Ministries 
to take the light of your Torah to all the nations of the world. So we thank you for any uh, donations or offering that people give, but it's all to bring the light of the Torah. Even as you said in Isaiah, you want to magnify the Torah once again and make it honorable, and that's what we want to do. We thank you for all those who are participating and being a light to the nations. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth, you have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planned among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. <clears throat> are you ready? Everyone got their seatbelt on. Their shoulder straps. Buckle in. We're going to go for a big ride. Last week, we were talking about the 13 attributes of God. Or you could say the 13 names of God. In, unlike English, basically, Hebrew, the names have meaning. All right? So what would you pick for your own name? If you could pick a name for you, you've got to pick your own name instead of having it given to you by your parents that would describe your character, who you are, what would you pick? What name would you pick to describe yourself? What? I'd be Henri. <laughs> I'm Henri. I really am, believe it or not. I think I'm Henri because I had five older sisters. I had, you know, a couple of older brothers. And uh, I was like the youngest. And... Uh, we always had names. My parents gave us all nicknames as well. I won't tell you mine. Um, I had a couple of them given to me. Huh? No. Uh, I was born in like 1956. And in 1957, my dad was in a real bad car accident. And he was in the hospital for a couple of years. And I'm only like one and a half years old, you know, about two and, of course, this is back in 57 now. But anyway, I had a, we went to, Mom took all the kids, all nine of us kids, to the hospital to visit Dad in the hospital. And I had a little Mickey Mouse hat on with the big ears, and so I ended up getting nicknamed Mickey Mouse. That was my name. So there you go. I won't tell you the other ones. <clears throat> but as we looked at last week, we started with the 13 attributes or names of God. How I many you know God has like 100 names? He's got all kinds of names. Just like there are 613 laws in the Torah, but God narrows it down to the 10 commandments. God has 100 names, but here in Exodus, God narrows his names down to 13 names. These are not just names, though. God is saying, I want you to know who I am. Now, names are important, but when God gives us a name that he's named himself, this is powerful. He's saying, this is who I am. Well, <clears throat> the first name we talked about last week is Lord, which is the, what's called the Tetragrammaton, or the yud Hey vav Hey, And it says it twice. It says, the Lord, the Lord God. What do you remember the first time the yud heh vav -Hey is mentioned, now, for those that are new to all this, in Genesis, 1, 1, in Genesis chapter 1, nowhere is the word Lord used. It's only God or Elohim. Because in Genesis 1, God's creating everything, and Elohim means the king, the boss, the judge. But then when man's created, God knew man cannot live by strict justice alone, so he introduces his other name, I'm the merciful God. And so <clears throat> what is said, the first time his name is mentioned, what we need to realize is God wanted mankind. He built a place for us before he even made us, just like the nursery you get ready before you have your kid. So we were planned. And so the first time when we call out the Lord's name, we're saying, look, I didn't choose to be here. <laughs> you know, I just got here. And I'm asking for mercy for whatever reason based on the fact that 
you made me. Okay, and so if you made me, you know, help. The second time, when we cry out the Lord, this time, we exist, but guess what? We've sinned. And so this time, we cry out, even though I've sinned, you still want me to remain alive that I might repent. God says that he's not willing that any should perish. So how many of you are glad the moment you sin, you didn't die? Which is amazing. And then the next one I just touched on last week, and I'm going to go into it in more depth today, is L, which is short for Elohim. All right? Now, this word means, like I said, the God of justice, the God of power. Okay, he creates everything by his right hand, it said, all of the universe. Well, look at Genesis 18, verse 25. Abraham is talking to God concerning the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, be it far from you to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So Abraham knows God as a judge of all of the earth, and he doesn't know the situation in Sodom and Gomorrah, but how many of us would say, yeah, God, go wipe them out, those wicked people, rather than intercede and tell God to repent. Don't do that, God. This is interesting. Well, what does strength or power have to do with God's attribute of mercy? How much power internally does it take to forgive somebody who's harmed you? Oh, man, that takes a lot of strength, a lot of power. You know, I mean, that what prevents, you know, oftentimes if someone gets in our face, you know, punch them in the face. God is always right. He has all the power. He doesn't, I mean, God gets angry. We're going to look at that. But he's long-suffering. That's one of his attributes. And for God to re, I mean, how many of us wouldn't, when people upset us, we just want to crush them, <laughs> get this over with? <laughs> well, look at Numbers 14, 15 through 19. This we talked about earlier. So I love how the Torah portion ties in also to what we're talking about. Moses says, if you kill all these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your fame will say you were impotent, Lord. You're not able to bring them in, so therefore you just killed them all in the wilderness. And <clears throat> then he says, but now I beseech you, let the power of my Lord be great, according as you have promised. So here he's saying, God, use your power it's since you're so powerful to forgive. That is amazing. And then he says, according as you said your name was, these 13 attributes, which is in Exodus 32. He says, <clears throat> the Lord is long-suffering, of great mercy. He forgives iniquity. And transgression, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to the third and fourth generations. Then he says, pardon, I beseech you the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your mercy. And as you have forgiven his people from Egypt until now. Forgiveness requires great strength. We are spiritually weak indeed if we can't forgive. That doesn't mean the consequences won't happen. I'm not saying, I'm not justifying the crime. You can forgive, but that person still has to pay the consequences. Okay, that has nothing to do with that. What I'm talking about is what you have to do to help resolve the insides of you. Showing mercy and forgiveness does not mean the avoidance of punishment. Let's look at Numbers 14, 20-23. Look what the Lord says. I pardoned according to your word, Moses. But then he says, as truly as I live, all the earth will be filled with my 
with the glory of the Lord, because all those men which have seen my glory, my miracles, I did in Egypt, in the wilderness, they've tempted me now these ten times, they've not listened to my voice, they will not see the land with that I swore to their fathers, neither shall any of them that who provoked me see it. So here we see God gave forgiveness, and yet they still have to suffer the consequences. If I say, if God says, don't stick your hand in the blender when it's moving, I command you, and I stick my hand in the blender, and my fingers get cut off, I can't blame God. He can forgive me for being stupid, but I'm not going to get my fingers back. Okay? You're following me. There is a prayer in the, it's called the Amidah. How many of you are familiar with the Amidah prayer? Okay. God is described as the one who helps those who are falling. He supports the falling. How do you know the force and nature of gravity is to pull you to the ground? Now, if you jump off a 10-story building or something like that, you can't say, well, I don't believe in the law of gravity. <laughs> the law of gravity really doesn't care whether you believe in the law of gravity or not. You're toast. Okay. But what happens sometimes, God will intervene, and what does God do when he intervenes? He reverses the very rules and power of nature that he created. God, how many know God can intervene and do a miracle? Just like when the Satan told Yeshua to jump off the cliff to prove he's the Messiah, okay? Well, he wouldn't do that. But if for some reason someone pushed him off the cliff, God could easily go against the laws of nature, intervene, and save him, right? It's the same with death. God can reverse the power of death and resurrect us from the dead, okay? God reverses the course of nature it's in the same way with forgiveness. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. This is a, a, an established law of nature. A person who sins is likened to someone who is mortally wounded, a walking corpse. Once we sin, we're a, we're a walking dead man. And the, what happens is God must overpower, God has to overpower his own word and the world by suspending the laws that he imposed in order to forgive. In other words, God says the soul that sins shall die. Now, he turns around and says, okay, I am going to change the laws and say you're going to live. What happens if there's a judge on earth or an area where you live where the people can speed all the time? What do people say? Hey, we can speed all the time here, right? And then what happens if all of a sudden uh, someone gets a ticket and then that person says, well, it's not fair. You let everyone speed. Why did you pick on me? So what happens when God forgives someone? He's going against his own rules. And so he's saying, well, you can live. And so the sinner goes, well, or the wicked goes, well, hey, God, you forgave them. Why can't you forgive me? You're not fair, God. So we have to understand this concept of forgiveness. So to enable forgiveness, we must appeal to God's strength to overpower the sin and our current condition to sustain us and allow us to continue to exist. When God wills that the water of the Red Sea stand up as a wall, yes, sir, and they stand up as a wall, and that does not conflict with his character. It actually doesn't even require a lot of strength for God. The one who told the water to lie flat can also tell the water to stand, but such is not the case when it comes to our sins. We request forgiveness, or when we request forgiveness, we are asking God to sustain evil. In order to sustain a person who sins, 
God must overpower himself, his character of goodness, and act against himself. When one is asking for compassion and mercy from the divine name of El, invoking God's attribute of strength, they have to be aware of the magnitude of strength that is required. What do I mean by that? How much... When God created the heavens and the earth with all of the wealth of the earth, all of the gold and silver and everything in it and all the buildings... How much power, I mean, God just what? He just spoke. Let there be earth. So if all the gold and silver were gone, he wouldn't care. He'd go, let there be earth again and gold and silver. He just speaks it. But look at how much power that it takes to forgive us. Think about it. The power that it takes to forgive us is enormous. He has to go against all the laws of nature. And this is absolutely incredible. Now, think of it this way. It's as if we are drowning in our sins and we're asking God. <laughs> so many Christians think he came to save us in our sins. He came to save us from our sins. In order... To sustain a person who sins, God must overpower himself. It's get, think of it this way. If we are drowning in our sins and we're asking God not to take us out of the water, but that the very water we're drowning in would actually prevent us from drowning. In other words, we're saying, God, I, uh, I'm worried about the consequence of my sin, not the sin itself. Don't save me from my sin. I love it too much. Just save me from the consequence of my sin. That's how much of Christianity is. They don't want to be saved from their sin. They want to be saved in their sin. Keep me in the mud, but just make sure I'm safe. It's not God. Get me out of the mud. It's just like this would be more than a request for compassion, but we also request that God be indifferent toward our sin. God, put up with my sin. Be indifferent toward my sin. It's inherently contradictory to ask that the goodness disregard one's sin and condition of sinfulness. All we can do is ask God's attributes of mercy to allow us to temporarily exist until we repent. Think about that for a minute. Wow, if, if we're walking and living in sin, we're asking God to let us continue to be alive until we repent. I don't know about you, but that's kind of heavy. Imagine a product that runs on batteries internally. And after purchasing it, let's say your cell phone, you abuse it and it stops functioning. And so you take it back to the manufacturer, what would they say? Warranty's no good. You're the one who... Drop it in the water. That was not my fault. Okay. And they explain that the product isn't defective, but its internal power source has been damaged. But due to the inventor's wisdom, it can also run on an external power source. But in order to function, it has to be attached to a source of electricity, a power external to itself. If something goes dead, what do you have to do? Charge it. Okay. This is the situation with humans who have sinned. The human being is not defective, but by sinning, they destroy their internal power source. We are God's creation, and after we destroy our internal power source through sin, we turn to God and ask him, through no fault of his, that he provide us with a new part and send us a current of power enabling us to continue to exist. This is quite brazen. Strictly speaking, God should say, go fix yourself. Yet we can make such a request because of God's covenant. So we see the first attribute 
the yud hey vav teaches us that the world is built through merciful kindness. That's how it was built. The second attribute of his name is that the world of sin can continue through merciful kindness. And then the third attribute, L, is that the world of sin is built and sustained through the strength of God's mercy to suspend justice that is due. So here God begins by declaring the most compassionate response first, then he's working outward, and that we find when we call upon L, we're saying, act against your very nature, God, that I may continue to exist. Back, uh, back in the 70s when I was young, first got saved, the Vietnam War was going on and uh, 75, right in there. And people were asking me or telling me, if there was a God, why doesn't he stop the wars? And I said, well, God can stop the wars. He could do it in an instant by wiping every selfish person off this planet. So when I'm done praying, are you still going to be here? <laughs> you know, but... Of course God could stop everything and make it right. But the thing is, he allows sin to go on because of the greater good of us repenting. They say God made repentance before he even created the earth. Okay, so that's the third attribute. We now come to the fourth attribute, which is merciful. And the Hebrew word is rakam. All right, it means to be merciful, very compassionate. When you proclaim God's name, just like, think about this. If you call on God as a husband or as a brother or as a king or as a healer, you're calling upon the name that meets your particular need. That's why there are different names of God. He can meet every one of our needs. Okay, well, when we call on I mean, how would you like some, hey, what's your name? My name's Merciful. Wow, you are merciful. I mean, he doesn't just show mercy, he is mercy. That's what we have to understand. He is mercy. We talked about that last week. <clears throat> now, when a person proclaims God's name as Racham, they say, please look at my mitigating circumstances. How many of you know we want God to... Look at the mitigating circumstances. Look what is going on. With rakam, there is justification. Rakam relates to specific individuals. An example would be if two people commit the same crime, but they receive different punishment based on mitigating circumstances. Rakam comes to the one who may be guilty, but deserves compassion. Now, I can give you a lot of examples of that. Uh, one example I like to talk about is uh, th uh, the orphanage situation, the three different levels of mercy, uh, different Hebrew words. It's like I have 100 uh, cookies, and I go to an orphanage with 100 kids, and I give every kid a cookie. That's one level of mercy. But then there's a little short kid that can't reach the cookie jar, so I get personally involved with their life. I pick them up and help get them the cookie. And then the last level of mercy is I'm going to take you home and adopt you. And so in English, they really mess those up, okay? So you don't understand the different level. Like it said, God says, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Well, that sounds tough. Well, which level of mercy is it? That's why we have to understand the Hebrew so we know what he's saying. Okay, so... With this one here, well, let me give you another example of mitigating circumstances. I, I told this story the other day, but remember the movie Cops or the TV series? I mean, Cops. Okay, well, my son was on that. Yes. He's on the East Coast with a friend, and they get separated, and he's trying to hitchhike back to his friend, and this lady in his white truck pulls up and says, I'll give you a ride. So he jumps in the truck and they're driving down the road. Well, all of a sudden, the police are chasing the truck because the lady in the truck had just robbed a gas station. Okay? 
And he's going, I'm with her, but I wasn't with her. He's following me. Okay, so he gets it. Even though they're both in the car, trotting together, one of them, no mercy showed, the other one, mitigating circumstances. Okay, so I'm just saying there's a lot of reasons why things happen. I remember one time, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and I'm going down this road, and I have to switch lanes, and then I get back to my lane, and a policeman stops me for switching lanes, okay? You know, without a blinker or whatever. I don't remember what it was exactly. But I end up going to court, and he's not there, and I get out of it. But I had a great reason. They had all kinds of construction cones, and the lines weren't painted, you know? And, and it's like, so this is why. But fortunately, I didn't have to worry about it. They let me go. Um, or I, like for another example, let's say you're speeding, and then they want to know why you're speeding. <sighs> My wife is pregnant, about to give a baby, and they're in the car. Okay, we'll let you go. So there's mitigating circumstances. <laughs> that reminds me of another one I won't tell because it's... <laughs> you're, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you. I have, uh, I'm diabetic. Okay, and I've got this little thing on my arm here that an alarm goes off on my phone that tells me I better check my blood sugar. So I take my phone and I can put it over this and see if it's real high, right, or real low. I'm going down the street and a policeman stops me. You were using your phone. And they say, we're using it for a medical reason? Oh, check my blood sugar. Check my blood sugar. <laughs> <laughs> I never did that, but I thought of it. <laughs> Mitigating circumstances. Let's go to Exodus 22, 26 and 27. I hope I didn't give anyone an idea here. About how it. Okay, Exodus 22, 26 and 27. It says, if you... At all, take your neighbor's raiment to pledge, and you deliver it to him by the sun goes down. That's what you're supposed to do, for that's his only covering. It's his raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep? And it shall come to pass when he cries to me, I will hear, for I am what? Gracious. Gracious. And that is the next one. The next word he calls himself. Not only am I rakam, I am also kanon. And that kanon is the one where God will personally intervene with the atheist in the foxhole. If someone is crying out to him, even though they're not good, he will still get personally involved with that person's life. It's like these two kids are crying to mom and dad, and they say, I have no justification. Just stop the pain, daddy. Stop the pain. You know, I know I've been bad. I'm in trouble, and it's right, but help me. So God says, that's fine. And he takes care of it. I want to talk about, uh, listen to Isaiah 30, 19. It says, for the people will dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very what? Gracious to you at the voice of your cry. When he will hear it, he will answer you. So even though they've been bad in Zion, if they cry out in honesty, stop the pain, God will personally intervene and stop the pain. So I'm going to summarize these first five attributes this way. The Lord creates the world according to his divine will. When sin occurs, the initial divine will can no longer sustain its existence. So the second attribute of the Lord then determines that he creates the world anew, for he also wills the existence of the world, even when it contains sin. And you're going to see that here in a minute. Therefore, the third attribute, L, forcefully sustains even the sin itself. But as sin endures, the fourth attribute, Rakam, assesses every creature looking for a reason to have compassion due to the special circumstances. But then there are sinners for whom all the justification runs out, and they are sentenced even after compassion or Rakam is invoked. They deserve the punishment until another attribute arrives on the scene, the fifth attribute, which is Canaan, where the Almighty grants an undeserved gift and even without justification by the attribute of Canaan. And why is this? The attribute of Canaan stems from the fact that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, 
the creator of heaven and earth, he actually identifies with us who were created in his image. And he became a human. So he can't identify with our pain. How many of you know if you're going through something, whatever it may be, and someone says, I understand, and you know, no, you don't. You don't have a flipping clue. Now, I'm not trying to be kind, but see, God became a human so that we would know he can relate. See, that's what's so amazing. Imagine you are angry at your computer. Or at your phone. Okay? It's not working. And what do you do? You disconnect it. And what would you do if all of a sudden it started wailing and shrieking? Help! Help! <laughs> would that evoke any feelings or pity? No. <laughs> you're going to take it and you're going to throw it away. But when one of our children cry out from being punished, we often show pity because the human cry affects our heart. We sympathize with those we identify with. Well, guess what? The Almighty identifies with us because we're created in his image. This is what we have to remember. Now look at Exodus 3, 7. What does the Lord say? I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I am feeling their pain. Seeing refers to factual knowledge and awareness of the events, but hearing implies taking these facts to heart in a way that brings identification with the pain. Hearing internalizes the pain. And this is why, listen to Joseph and his brothers in Genesis 42, 21. They said one to another, Verily, we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul in his making supplication to us, but we did not hear. They wouldn't relate. They wouldn't relate emotionally to their brother. And they say, that is why this distress is come upon us. So when a person declares God's fourth name, Racham, they say, look at the mitigating circumstances but when they declare his fifth name, Canaan, they're crying out, look, I have no justification, but please stop the pain. So when we declare these attributes of God's name, we need to have a greater awareness of what that name means so we can be a proper vehicle bearing his name to the world. We're supposed to be bearers of God's name. And the priestly blessing at the end, when we say the priestly blessing, we're saying God not only bless us, but God puts his name upon us. What name does he put upon us? He's got a hundred names. You know, it's the yud heh vav because within that is where all the names come back to is the name. He's our healer, who's our Jehovah Rapha, okay? But Rapha is the name, but it stems from the merciful God, the yud heh vav Every one of his names come from the yud heh vav and so this brings us to the sixth attribute, which is long-suffering, or Eric Apayin. Here's the thing about that name. How many of you, when you think of anger, you know, this word, Eric Apayin, means God is so angry, he's got fire coming out of his nose. That's what it implies in Hebrew. He is so upset. And so we call on the word or his name. Hi, my name is Long Suffering. How are you doing? Well, what we're telling God when we call upon this name is we know you're very angry and thank you for giving us time to repent. We're thanking God. Give us time to repent. We thank you for allowing us to exist until we do repent. In other words, it means delaying his anger. That's what it means. He's long suffering. He's delaying his anger. Now, the word off is singular, referring to God's patience to both the righteous and with the wicked. The very word off refers to the nose, hence the face. It's from the rapid breathing in passion or anger. Look at 1 Peter 4.18. This is 
an amazing verse. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? The righteous are barely saved. Another way of looking at delaying something like his anger is to extend or create a space for distance. So one could say that God distances himself from his anger for the time being, kind of like the last 2,000 years. The Almighty controls his anger and does not consume the sinner. Look at Psalm 711. God judges the righteous, but God is angry with the wicked every day. But he delays his anger. He allows them to live. The purpose is for repentance. In Ezekiel 18.31, it says, Cast away all your transgressions where you've transgressed. Make a new heart and a new spirit, for why will you die, O house of Israel? So distancing anger doesn't mean eliminating anger. In Jeremiah 50.25, the Lord has opened his armory, and he has brought forth the weapons of his fury. Can you imagine? If God is really angry, this is what's coming very shortly to a planet near you. God is going to allow his fury to be poured out, all right? Uh, and so the attribute of Eric Apayim in the mindset of the person who's declaring Eric Apayim must include a feeling of God's smoldering anger as well as a glimmer of hope for repentance. So his name is actually long-suffering, which brings us to the next attribute, uh, which is Rav Kesed, abundant in Goodness. Let me look at something. One of the things that is, let me look at this just a second. I'm going to escape. I want to see where I have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is what is so amazing. How many of you know when someone gets angry, they start yelling at you? But God is long suffering. As a matter of fact, look at this. Isaiah 53, 7, Yeshua is speaking about in Isaiah 53. He was oppressed, yet when he was afflicted, what happens? He didn't open his mouth. As a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is mute, so he didn't open his mouth. In other words, he suffered in silence. God has been, he's long-suffering, which means for 2,000 years, God has been suffering putting up with mankind. He's been silent, but do you know what? Who knows what this word is right here? Aleph, Lamed, it's Elohim. This is God's name, Elohim. The word for silent is Aleph, Lamed, Mem, Alim, in this verse. God's name means I am silent in my grief. The very name Elohim means a God who is silent in his grief. How many of us, whenever we're in grief, we just want to let the whole world know? But that's amazing to me about God's name. Elohim means a God who is silent when he is upset. Okay, so the next one is abundant in goodness or Rav Chesed. Now, if you remember, I started with the uh, most gracious, which is Rakam. I want to adopt and take him home. Then we went to Kanan, which means I'll get personally involved. And now we're at Chesed, okay, which is where God is good to everybody, the good and the bad. So we're looking at abundant and goodness. Look at Micah 7, 18 through 20. Who is a God like you that pardons iniquity? That word is nose, and we're going to look at that next week more. He passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retains not his anger forever, but he delights in what? Mercy. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the word kibosh? I'm going to put the kibosh on that. Do you know that's the Hebrew? There's a Hebrew word called kibosh. And you're going to find it in your notes. It says, he will turn again. He will have compassion on us. And he will subdue or put a kibosh on our iniquities. And you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You will perform the truth to Jacob, the mercy to Abraham, which you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. That Hebrew word nose, which means pardon, okay, is also like the word nasa, which means to lift. In other words, it's kind of like there's a scale, and our badness outweighs our goodness, 
And so we ask God, would you please lift, change the scales, make it, my goodness, heavier than my badness, okay? God, we want your help. So in order to create a world of free will, God had to take a step back, and we need to bear full responsibility for our own decisions, and yet everything remains in God's power. And so when we recite this name or attribute of God, it's as if we're asking him not to judge us only by our free will choices, but also with his abundant goodness, would he please take some of the responsibility to help tilt the scales in our favor? Isn't that fascinating? So we're going to look at the rest of it. We see abundant in goodness, which is raw chesed, means please tilt the scales in our favor, God. So those are just seven of God's name, and uh, there's 13. So we're going to go over six more next week. And so we can get a better understanding. Because when we call upon the name of the Lord, it says, to call upon the name of the Lord, what are we saying? I mean, if, if I said, uh, Jack, well, what does Jack mean? Okay, well, we, when we call upon the Lord, we need to know which name to call upon. Does that make sense? All right, let's stand.